Uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us for uh, this uh, uh, short session of KT Canada in which I was invited to talk about the role of clinical practice guidelines outside the clinical encounter, which is part of my uh, thesis work at McMaster University with Dr. Melissa Browers, who I give a special thanks because without her help and support, it wouldn't be possible to do this project. So, um, uh, as Megan said, I am now located in Colombia, but I've been traveling back and forth between Canada and Colombia. And uh, my focus of the focus of my research is about how guidelines uh, can be used or are used in different uh, scenarios outside the clinical decision, outside the clinical encounter. So this is what I am going to talk to you about in the following slides. Um, uh, I have no financial conflict of interest to declare, and, and intellectual and academic, so uh, I have to declare that I'm the current leader of the ACRI collaboration, and no, mother, no other conflicts to, to disclose at this point. I am going to make a brief background of why we ended up uh, studying this issue, and we are going also to go through the critical interpretive synthesis that we conducted and the results, which are, of course, the main um, content of this uh, presentation. And um, I am going to describe a little bit about the major roles, which are the ones that you can see on your screens, quality of care, financial decision, education and licensing, research prioritization, and judicial decisions. I will make a final summary of the relationships between these roles and some conclusions to wrap up the session. So why the clinical encounter? Why we use this term? So we define and is defined the literature that a clinical encounters is any physical or virtual contact between subject or patients and a healthcare practitioner during which there is an assessment of or a clinical activity that is performed. So uh, usually this is the, the, the encounter between the, the healthcare workers and the and the and the patients. And during this um, encounter, there are a couple of, or there are major decisions that are made by clinicians regarding the, the care, the patient's care. Or there are decisions that are taken by patients regarding their own health, with or without the support of the clinician. So when we frame this as a clinical encounter, we want to um, um, describe that there are a couple of, there are a lot of uh, decisions that are taken between the clinician and the patient regarding their uh, patient health. So there are other decisions and other activities that occur outside of this clinical encounter that may or may not affect that clinical environment that are performed by different stakeholders and they are considered outside of the clinical encounter. So we are talking about all these kind of decisions that are related or are, that are made in a health system, um, in any health system from a health management point of view or even legal decisions that are indirectly related with the clinical encounter. So when we talk about clinical encounter, we're focusing only on patients and clinician decision and any other decision that occurs outside of this level but could directly or indirectly affect that clinical encounter, those are those were the decisions or the 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 scenarios that we were interested in. So what we know that the clinical practice guidelines support clinicians in making clinical decisions. We know that. That is the main role of clinical practice guidelines. All the decisions that are taken uh, at the at the clinical or the micro level uh, th that is the main focus of guidelines. So the adoption of guidelines by these clinicians, we know that it is not perfect, but they are, to some level, to some degree, guidelines are used by them. And we agree that clinical practice guidelines aim to reduce the gap between the evidence and practice. We know that historically clinical guidelines respond in emerge uh, to a need to for a need to standardization, cost containment, and reduce variability, but they focus on informing clinicians. So if we see at the history of guidelines, 
uh, mostly in the U.S. and later in the U.K. and then in the rest of the world, uh, guidelines are a response to try to uh, standardize and make some const containment uh, decisions and reduce the clinical variability in the decision. But they are focused on the guidelines. And this kind of more or less uh, disagreement between what historically push forward the development and push forward the expansion of the clinical practice guidelines, mostly in the U.S. but around the world, are some of the roles for which guidelines were intended to be developed, even though the final decision making of clinic of clinicians were the main role or the main uh, focus. So the, the use of guidelines by clinicians have been extensively studied, the barriers, the facilitators, the adherence. And all these kind of uh, uh, research, which is implementation science, have been to it. But we do know that the use by guide, the guide of guidelines, but other stakeholders to take decisions at different levels may not have been as studied as the role of guidelines for clinicians. So we thought that the use and adoption of by different stakeholders, other than clinicians and patients, have not been analyzed in depth. So what we didn't know, what we don't know, we what are the roles that guidelines could have outside the clinical and patient decisions? How guidelines are playing this role? Are guidelines good tools to inform decisions outside the clinical encounter? Should we use guidelines for those decisions or should we just create different tools that could inform those decisions and leave guidelines only for clinical decisions? Or, or maybe guidelines should be uh, modified to, to, to make them fit better into this role, that's what we don't know. So we uh, uh, design a critical interpreted synthesis, which is a, a comprehensive systematic review uh, to try to uh, identify from the literature main concepts, themes, and topics, and to create a theory about uh, a specific question. So our aim was to understand how and under what condition guidelines are used in areas beyond the traditional clinical encounter for decision making. We conducted this critical interpretive system previously registered at the Prospero Systematic Review database. We made searches in the major databases. We also did uh, searches in great literature and we included studies that discuss the potential roles of guidelines in different contexts. We didn't, as happens in this critical interpreting synthesis studies, we didn't uh, uh, limit for a specific study design. We included all the literature, regardless if they were research papers or non-research papers. We did an, a synthesis of the data, so, and ag aggregating the data, and also interpreting the, area, the evidence that we found, and we developed an explanatory framework of how do we think guidelines are used for this kind of decisions? This is the summary of the results. And we included 220 studies after making a comprehensive review of almost 20,000 papers. And, and finally, we included 220. Most of the evidence, most, more than half of the evidence came from the US. And then the second most um, productive country in terms of this evidence was the UK, then Canada, the Netherlands, and Germany, which traditionally have been um, major players in the guidelines, enterprise in researching guidelines. Uh, we found evidence from 1987, mostly to 2019, most of the, of the literature came from this range, time, uh, time, time frame. The major roles that we identify in the literature uh, can be summarized in these major roles. The quality of care, coverage and reimbursement decision, health professionals, education and licensing, research prioritization, and judicial decision. There are other roles that are not very well developed or at least not very well reported or described in the literature that I will go through them. And they don't have too much evidence uh, uh, or too much uh, papers about, that discuss about them. The first and the most important, um, the most familiar role for many of you would be the role of, uh, of guidelines in taking decisions about quality of care at different levels of the health system. This is the most common role outside the clinical encounter and the, uh, to support decisions that are aimed to improve the quality of care. So improving quality is consistently mentioned as the main benefit of guidelines. We know that. And when we 
describe all the benefits. It's always the quality as the, a major factor in why guidelines exist. This is even by the literature part of the reason why the guidelines had a, had a huge expansion in the United States in the 90s. Early, uh, the, uh, by the late 80s and early 90s, there was a huge expansion of guidelines. Uh, the production of guidelines increased uh, substantially, uh, mostly by uh, professional societies. And one of the major factors that historically in the literature is highlighted as the reason for that was the need for regulating the quality, for increasing standardization between physicians. So what is the rationale for this? It's, it's, pretty straightforward. If we have best evidence, we, 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 we think that we're going to have best, the best quality of care. So uh, within the quality of care, we um, uh, found um, several roles and we can group them in these three major ideas. The development of quality standards and, ind and indicators, the supporting of accredit accreditation activities and supporting financial incentive strategies. Regarding the quality develop, the development of quality indicators and standards. So this may be one of the most studied roles of guidelines outside the clinical encounter. That is to inform the development of these standards and indicators. A quality or a clinical standard is an agreed process that should be undertaken or an outcome that should be achieved for a particular circumstance or diagnosis or even sign or symptom in which a healthcare uh, a healthcare system or a health institution is interested in focusing because this is considered a good um, uh, a process to highlight depending on the disease, depending on the, the priority that the healthcare or the health organization could have. Quality indicators are, as, as its name says, are indicators that are defined as explicitly defined and measurable items which act as building blocks in the assessment of care. So the development of these standards and indicators uh, is a very common activity that is developed in many organizations and health systems, but how, what is the role of guidelines on them? So the, the development of these two tools, if I could uh, call them like that, are commonly based on clinical practice guideline recommendations. The two major approaches to this is that guidelines could have an implementation section, and that is what, what we, what we expect that a high quality clinical practice guideline could have in the, the main manuscript is that the guidelines come with an implementation section and implementation chapter that uh, in which, sorry, in which uh, the, the guideline development group is recommending what to do to, to enhance the implementation of the guidelines. So if the guideline has this implementation section, it is recommended that the, the guideline itself recommend quality indicators in order to measure and to make a follow-up of the process of implementation of that guideline. So when the guidelines have the quality indicator, this is a way in which we are translating the guideline to quality improvement to quality indicators processes. On the other side, clinical practice guideline could have or not these quality indicators. Uh, regardless of that, as uh, implementers or quality indicator professional, people who are doing quality improvement activities could uh, select the guideline and extract from them, from the key recommendations, could uh, develop with the quality indicators that are considered to be of priority for a specific organization. Um, based on that guideline and based on that, those key recommendations, they create quality indicators that are going to be used in quality improvement activities. However, even though this is very common, this is, it happens every day in many healthcare organizations, the link between guidelines and, and the quality improvement activity, activities is not clear in the literature. There, there has been some, some research and there has been some interest in improving this link and there, are, there is some work in how to re develop this method to develop this indicator. What would be the best recommendations to to choose how to prioritize recommendation, how to transform those recommendations in a specific indicators. There, are, there is not enough guidance on this and there is something to work on this because it's all is used every day and the specific link is not completely clear. On the other side, we also have the accreditation of financial incentives. Accreditation of healthcare services. You know that accreditation is a framework for quality at hospitals and makes 
in many accreditation procedures, it makes mandatory to systematically evaluate the data from clinical registries in order to improve quality of the of, of care in the, in the organization. So guideline recommendations become a key element in this process. Uh, it has been, there is evidence that the fully accredited, accredited hospitals are more compliant to clinical practice guidelines. Guidelines are chosen based on priority uh, diseases that are chosen for the accreditation processes and based on the recommendations, these are, should be the ones who are measured to uh, provide information for the accreditation activities. Also, financial incentives, uh, the, which are defined as the positive or negative, positive that could be rewards, and negative that could, could be penalties, that incentives that are created with the aim to impact, for, uh, to have an impact on the performance of organizations and physicians. Uh, financial incentives have been very, very, and are used everywhere, but there have been a lot of interest and a lot of discussion about their appropriateness, uh, mostly in the U.S. The, well-known pay for performance uh, activities have been used uh, 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 for many hospitals in the U.S. in response in response to the increase of healthcare costs in the 90s. So recommendations are used as benchmarks to define the ideal care. So physicians receive financial bonuses according to their adherence to pre-established recommendations. That is the way it uh, the role that guidelines could have on this. Uh, on this activity. We know how um, uh, controversial this use is. I'm not going to get in depth on this, but this is another role for which guidelines um, are being used in, spe in, in a specific country or a specific healthcare system. The second major role are the financial decisions. The financial decisions account for the need for cost control. That was the second reason why has been explained or has been discussed. That is the reason why guidelines had a, a huge expansion in the United States in the 1990s. The creation of the HRQ in the United States organization, the agency, and the NICE in the UK uh, uh, kind of uh, marked the, the involvement in the history of guidelines, the involvement of governments in the clinical practice guideline enterprise. More directly in the NICE in the UK and in the UK uh, example rather than in the US exa example, but at least there was an interest in the group of the governments to, uh, uh, not in some cases to develop their own guidelines, like for instance happened in the UK, but in other places like in the US and other countries, to try to regulate somehow what guidelines, what would be the method, or what guidelines should be used. And the major aim behind this was quality and also cost. And we're going to make a discussion in the next slide about how cost, or how guidelines may play a role in the, in the, in the, in the spend, healthcare expenditure. There are at least two ways in which guidelines can be used in these decisions. Uh, for coverage and reimbursement decision, and for healthcare rationing and controlling cost. For coverage and reimbursement decision, clinical guidelines have had roles in what should be included, included in insurance co coverage or benefit plan, depending on the healthcare system. The rationale is the guidelines are going to say what works, plus the addition of cost consideration to that definition of what works, uh, i.e., uh, including cost effectiveness analysis would be a good combination to take decisions for this kind of uh, healthcare system. So there has been an increasing interest in including cost in guidelines in, in, the, the, grade, in the grade methodology in the agreed recommendation about what should be a good, one of the major factors to consider when doing a recommendation is to consider cost. The question is how to consider cost. Considering cost could be just a, a, in the development of recommendation just by clinical experience, opinion of experts when they are doing the guideline, measuring on, or analyzing cost, uh, uh, analyzing real cost, official cost from the health system or from the health organizations, or using cost effectiveness analysis from the literature. That is making systematic reviews of cost effectiveness analysis evidence 
to summarize and to inform the decision making within the clinical practice guidelines, or some cases less frequently to develop their own cost effectiveness analysis within the development of the clinical practice guideline, which is what happened, for instance, in the in in the in NICE in the UK, in which cost effectiveness analysis is developed as part of the process of the guideline development. The current approach in most of the, most of the places in which guidelines are informing uh, coverage decision or benefit plans or insurance decisions are that guidelines are developed by different developers. It could be by association, by governments. They are focused on clinicians as they are right now. And there is, there are cost effectiveness analysis, analysis there are cost effectiveness analysis, sorry, developed by a separate organization using information from the guidelines to inform the process. So there is a third party who develops the analysis, the economic analysis, and take the drug funding decisions, but use clinical practice guideline recommendation to help to inform the process and the analysis to take a final decision. But the cost effectiveness analysis is developed from outside of the clinical practice guideline. There are also two other factors to consider when talking about costs and guidelines. Are these two major, uh, this two major concepts which are rationing and containment? There are two interpretations. So guidelines indirectly, when we were talking about cost effectiveness analysis, we're talking about more direct, direct effect of guidelines on cost or on fi financial decision. When we talk about this financial decision could be more indirect. And there are two interpretations. Guidelines could be used as a tool to implement what is called implicit rationing. This is a positive concept, of, concept about efficiency. We know that there is a scarcity of resources in, in all healthcare systems, and there is need for targeting to those resources, those resources to obtain the best value for money. So guidelines, guidelines, when they are recommending the best and trying to reduce the variability, they are encouraging clinicians to make rational clinical decisions, to take a decision about what is the best based on the evidence, but also to consider costs and to be very rational when taking decisions about what to recommend in the, in the development. So healthcare rationing is a positive context. It's about obtaining the best value for money. It's complex, but it's good to have in mind that there is uh, there is a need for making efficient management of their resources. On the other side, there is uh, the clinical practice guideline has been in the, has been seen in the literature as tools from a negative point of view as a tool to implement what is called cost containment or cost cutting. This is a negative concept that that uh, guidelines are could be used to deny services regardless of the quality of effectiveness. And this has, there has been a lot of discussion, a lot of literature, mostly in the United States, uh, about how insurance companies could use guidelines to, uh, 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 to, to implement recommendations that could be useful for them, for the insurance companies, to reduce the healthcare expenditure regardless if the guidelines is of high quality or the guideline was developed with the best method, or the guidelines is uh, outdated, or the guideline is only chosen because it's the one which was recommending the cheapest intervention. So opponents to the use of guidelines as a cost containment or cost cutting tool argue that guidelines are commonly used in the name of quality, but they are an imposition from managers and policymakers to reduce healthcare costs and restrict services regardless of the impact of quality, namely just a cost containment tool. This should not be the role of guidelines, and rarely may be the case, but this has been the discussion in the literature, about, mostly from clinicians that feel that the autonomy is being threatened by the use of guidelines by healthcare manager, insurance, or policymakers. So the idea is to promote the positive concept, concept, which is making efficient management of resources, and that's why we recommend considering costs in the recommendation development. A third goal, which is not a major role, but we consider it a secondary role, is the use of guidelines for health professional education and licensing. Clinical practice guidelines will now summarize the best evidence. They should be Key for teaching and learning is what the literature and many experts in guidelines have recommended. If we have a comprehensive review of the literature in order to 
answer a previously established clinically important question, we expect that the summary of the evidence and the final recommendation will be very helpful to teach undergrad residents and physicians and clinicians and healthcare workers in general about what should be the best way to take decision at the clinical level. So guidelines have been used and they are commonly used uh, in three different levels for educational licensing. It could be in health professionals education, wherever the health professional uh, field we're talking, medicine, nursing, nutrition, physiotherapy, in which in the process of, uh, uh, of teaching, guidelines are used uh, in the lectures, are used in residence training. Uh, these are very common use, but it depends on the school, it depends on the interest of the professor or the instructor, or the lecturer. So the, um, it's not a, there is not a specific protocol or there is, not a, uh, there is no way to know that they are used in all the um, education settings that we would like, considering all the process that, are, that is behind a guideline, the evidence synthesis, and what we expect a good quality of evidence synthesis and assessment, we would expect that would, they would be more used. But, but we don't have evidence of how much they are used for lectures and residence training. There are a couple of literature, there is some literature, but uh, that say that they have been used, but there is not specific of, of guidance on how they are used. Um, and there are no methodologies of, of how to introduce them or how. Uh, 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 lecturers or instructors are using are choosing the guideline. How are they assessing them, or if they are just showing the recommendation, or they are assessing also the quality. In terms of continuing medical education, we, so we know that this is a very commonly used um, method to disseminate guidelines. So conference economy congresses and workshops are used for disseminating of guidelines, and this will depend on who developed the guideline and who is in, who is organizing the conferences and to, 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 to know um, to see how much guidelines are used in this context. So the, the, the thing with, with continuing medical education is that um, it has been studied as a very, very, com very good tool to make implementation of guidelines. So uh, the guidelines maybe end, end up being part of a continuing medical education process because there is an active implementation process uh, that derive from the guidelines and push forward to introduce recommendation on the continuing medical education activities. But there is not a specific guidance on how clinical, uh, sorry, continuing medical education should consider or not guidelines and how could we improve that all the continuing medical education activities are considering guidelines to be, to be, to be disseminated uh, in their in their activities. And finally, licensing and maintenance of certification. We know that there is the maintenance of certification processes in North America that is based on web-based models. Um, they are most of, many of these models are developed based on clinical practice guideline recommendation. We found that the literature there are not good methodologies of how to link the recommendation to these efforts or how to improve the communication between licensing and maintenance of certification process and guideline developers. Research prioritization was the fourth, the fourth uh, role that we found in the literature. Very interesting role, I could say, one of the most, most interesting from my side, which is, uh, I would think, uh, a role that could have a huge impact, and I think it hasn't been studied, at least in the literature, we didn't find enough evidence of how we could improve the link between, between research prioritization and guidelines. So because guidelines summarize the best evidence, thus we think the guidelines are, or are going to be the best tools to identify research gap. This tool has been identified from the early 90s. The, when the, in the United uh, we had the, the major publication and the major papers about guidelines and their role. From them, from from that time, there was an interest on, or there was a, a, a the research prioritization was highlighted as a key role that should be studied. But it hasn't been studied. Uh, we think that guidelines are or will be very useful for researchers and research funding agencies because 
we will identify what are the gaps. There are two different models here. Uh, one would be generating a list of research priority that would be in post-publication. Uh, how does it work? Researchers or research funders can do a deep review of guideline, identify in the manuscript, in the guideline document, what are the areas that, which, that will need more research. And in this case, their funders or the researcher are prioritizing based on the recommendations, usually focus on those recommendations that are of low quality or have weak, weak recommendations. Because they are weak or they have low quality because usually we will need more uh, evidence on this specific question, on this specific field. In this case, it's post-publication. It's just using guidelines that are already available. On the other side, we have the option of creating a specific recommendation for future research, and this is during the development, and that is, this is on the developer's hands. Some guidelines highlight, specifically highlight the gaps and recommend what to research. Research recommendation or further research are two labels that we can find in some guidelines and some specific uh, methodological approach are recommending to introduce a specific session of research uh, last grade in the, in the guideline. So, and also if we want to be, be go beyond, we developers should advise in how to fill that gap, what population to focus, what outcomes, on what study designed to use to improve that gap. That would be ideal if developers could highlight that. So a close relationship or partnership between research agency and guideline developers that are part of, or are funded by the same, um, uh, the same player, for instance, what happened in the UK, there has been some interest in aligning better the development of NICE guidelines with the research funding agency to try to put the money on those gaps that are identified by the guidelines. So, however, there is not enough guidance on how better use guidelines for this purpose neither. So this is a very interesting role to work more. And finally, we, we have the judicial decisions, and we call this not a role, but the consequence, a role that is there that happens, but is not a role for which guidelines were developed. This is a natural consequence of the power of guidelines. So if guidelines are recommending what is expected to be the best course of action. We expect that from the judicial point of view, they are, they are used. They are used in two different ways, as a sort or a shield. A sort, it means that they are used as inculpatory tools in which the guideline is used as a sword by the plaintiff to prove that a physician has deviated from what should be considered the standard. In this case, from the judicial point of view, the standard is considered the clinical practice guideline recommendation. From the other side, the sculpatory tools, it could be used as shields in which the physicians, the physician, who, uh, the defendant physician can use the guideline to demonstrate that they follow the standard of care in, the, in a judicial process. So the guidelines are used as evidence in this decision, and this use has been very controversial. There is some literature about this, about the benefits, about the the cons, and the issue is guidelines are not mandatory. We know that. So, it's, but it's being accepted that clinicians should be aware of the most accepted recommendation, and deviation from the recommendation could be could occur but they should be supporting a convincing rationale. And that is what, uh, what, that is the main discussion what happened in the judicial decision use of guidelines. Although this role has been described, there is no clear guideline how they should be used or if they should be, should continue to be used. Of course, there are people against this, but also people in favor because a physician that made the things that like we could say well, they could use the guidelines to defend themselves. Other roles that were in the literature that have interest for health managers or health service decisions, health, uh, is supporting policymakers in deciding how to allocate resources, supporting decisions of where to spend money by bringing attention to new services recommended, making changes in the healthcare service, considering the recommendation, certifying services in a specific disease management or according to the use of guidelines or identifying fields or gaps for the development of health technology assessment um, um, process. So in summary, the main goal of a guideline, of course, the clinical encounter, which is the blue, the blue circle that you see here, which is the most important focus of guideline, but depending on the healthcare system, the funder, or depending on who is using the guideline, there could be some uses 
in the orange and the green uh, circles that you can see here. So the two major additional roles, additional to the clinical encounter decision, are all the decisions to improve the quality of care at different levels of the healthcare system and financial decisions. And of course, it depends on the healthcare system and the structure to see how much guidelines are used. Uh, if there is one payer, if there, are, if there is insurance, whatever the healthcare system is organized, guidelines could play a role also in this. And as you can see, they are closely, closely interrelated because decision at the quality of care level and financial decision could have an impact on clinical encounter decision and vice versa. And this uh, uh, figure kind of summarizes how clinical practice guidelines are in the middle of this black circle and how the role that I described could have an impact on the decision. The final physician and patient decision is the core of this uh, process in the healthcare system, and we know that. This kind of decision and this relationship is the most important element. But clinical practice guidelines could inform quality of care decision at different levels, and this quality of care will have some impact on this a physician-patient relationship, clinical encounter. On the other side, the guidelines could have uh, some decisions that have impact on cost, and they also, this decision will have impact on the decision that the clinician is going to take. Uh, and minor roles are the clinical, uh, the medical education, the CME, in which guidelines could inform this, and the continual medical education and education itself will have an impact on physicians. Also, the cost-effectiveness analysis and the HTA agencies could use guidelines to inform their process, and these processes are going to have an impact on cost, and they will indirectly have some impact on the decisions at the clinical encounter. So guidelines at the same time will have the possibility of informing or making, uh, uh, identifying research gaps that will increase, that will um, um, will trigger some new research that will increase the research knowledge. And at the end, the research knowledge is the main um, factor that uh, uh, feed the clinical practice guideline, but also um, this knowledge could be used to improve the quality, but also could be used to improve the method of clinical, sorry, of cost effectiveness analysis, and also the research knowledge that could be derived could be, we could obtain from guidelines, could also inform the cost decision. So at the end, everything is related. If there is a close relationship, guidelines are aimed to inform the physician and patient encounter, but informing this other field, this other decision, and these other stakeholders, they could have an impact directly or indirectly, and they could use to be to improve the quality and to make a more rational, more efficient use of uh, healthcare of healthcare um, healthcare money. So, limitation of further research. We know that quality and financial decision are the most common and only primary roles outside the clinical encounter. But education and research prioritization, we the, we uh, consider that we could consider them as secondary goals that would that will require con further study, and that judicial decisions are only consequence and should not be uh, considered roles of guidelines. There is no clear guidance in how to move from recommendation to many of these roles, except for quality in the cases which is a field that has has had in the in the last decade some 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 interest and some some research and each guideline should clearly state if they are intended for being used in this role or to pro, or they should provide tools to help guidelines to be used in these roles more research is needed to define whether guidelines should or should not adapt to respond to these roles so as a conclusion, uh, guidelines, the main aim is to support clinical encounter decision. We know that. Uh, there is also a long history of guidelines um, that is closely, uh, uh, that uh, has its roots initially in the U.S., but uh, most of this expansion that happened in the U.S. was is rooted in the cost and standardization. Two major, um, two major roles that um, uh, at different degrees were the intended aims of expanding guidelines or funding guidelines. And clinical encounter decisions are closely related to these other decisions in these other fields. So 
we cannot see guidelines. Only informing clinical decisions, is, uh, they are completely interrelated with these uh, fields as well. Um, clinical practice guidelines are used and they will continue be, being used in these roles. But the real impact and the appropriateness of this use is still a matter of study. Key methodological changes should be considered if there is an interest in improving their utility in this role. I am not saying that we should change the methodology of doing guidelines to inform this role. It depends on who funds the guideline, who is the developer, what is the interest that that organization, that government, or that development group has in, what, in how the guidelines should be used. If they are interested in that the guideline could be used for what, some or all of these roles, so the organization, the developer, or the funding organization should consider what methodologies or what tools should they create to improve how guidelines are used for this role. Governments, associations, patient groups, etc. whoever is the organization who is developing the guideline. Also, the users. This is another thing that, uh, to consider is the user of the roles, and I mean with users, here the research agency, funding agency, certification bodies, educators, quality improvement professionals, decision makers, lawyers, or whatever user of these additional roles, uh, maybe they need more training in how to use guidelines because it's not about how it's not about using or not using. It's about how to use. I could use the guideline to inform the process, but or I could use just the guideline to try to make it mandatory, which is which should be should not be the case. Should not be the recommendation. Guidelines should inform. Should be used as a guidance, but not as a mandatory tools in whatever roles of what we are. Uh, describing. So maybe there is a need to, to, to improve the understanding and the assessment of these guidelines by these users if you, we want a better use, considering the limitations the guidelines could have. And there is no evidence, there is no research or literature about how to inform or how to um, uh, train this user or if they should be trained or not, and we think that they should be trained uh, and how better to assess and consider quality, consider guidelines. So finally, there are two major roles in addition to clinical and counter decision, quality of care and financial decision. So those are the main roles outside the clinical encounter. In green, we have here the, what we consider the two secondary roles which are not the major interests of guidelines, but they are, they could be very useful and they should consider, should be considered, and we need more research and more uh, study on this, which are research prioritization and health professional education and licensing. They require more in, more in research and more, more interest to, to, to develop. And the role of judicial decision, as I, as I told you, although controversial, they will continue existing. And the link of guideline might also be focused on further study in some contexts. And that is what I, have, what I have for you today. I'm happy to hear any questions. Megan? Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes or no? I can hear you, I don't know everyone else. Okay, good. Um, okay, so they can hear me on the phone, that's good. Uh, okay, so I have a couple of questions. Um, so if anyone wants to send in questions, please do um, via the chat box. So I will start us off. So can you tell us, um, Dr. Flores, what key recommendations or suggestions would you give to developers to introduce in their guidelines with the aim of considering these roles? Okay. So, as I just said, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. <laughs> okay. As, as, as I can, I, I just said, it depends also of the funder. It depends on who is developing the guideline, who is funding, if it is part of the government or is part of the associations. Uh, most of these roles, or at least many of them, are closely related to public policies. And therefore, if the developer is a governmental organization, I would say that they should consider these roles in advance before developing the guideline and consider 
as users, the people that I just described, and then considering adding a specific session that will help to use guidelines, improving or maybe making more, uh, making it stronger the implementation session with more guidance on how this guide, this recommendation could be used in this decision for drug funding, for instance, making discussion about public policy and how, what is the impact or what would be the, the use of, right, of guidelines for public policy or, or even for research funding, uh, creating a specific recommendation of research that could be used for research uh, funding agency. And that will, it will be useful for reducing the gap between between what is uh, of the gaps that are found in the literature. So it depends on who is, and when governments are part of the development, they should improve this and speci specifically describe what are their the roles they want and what are the users. Okay, thank you. Um, and we have another question. This one is coming from Ottawa. They ask, should clinical experts be involved in clinical practice guidelines? particularly if government is funding the guidelines? Okay, so it is expected that uh, we have clinical experts on the development of guidelines because uh, the aim of guidelines is to try to, not only to summarize the evidence, regardless if it is funded by the government or by an association or a patient representative, always clinicians should be there to provide their insights and their experience on the clinical management of the patients that have the disease um, of interest of the guidelines. So uh, re uh, in the professional associations or societies, guidelines, uh, it's common that we have m uh, many, many experts, many clinical experts. Um, and, and in the government organizations guidelines, we also have the expert. So usually the number of clinical experts is a little bit less than the clinicians in the in the prof associations the uh, or guidelines, but both types of guidelines, associations or government funded, they should have clinical experts always because it's the only way to provide their insight or their experience in the clinical encounter decision because at the end, as I show you, uh, regardless of the interest, a clinical practice guideline, the final aim is to inform the clinical encounter decision. So there should be expert of every field which is involved in the management of this kind of patients. Every, an expert of every field should be uh, in that guideline development group. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question here. Uh, which one of these roles do you think should be a priority to focus on in Canada? So, Canada, for instance, is very different from other developed countries, and the UK has been a leader in the process of guidelines. We know that NICE has been a leader, but NICE is a government-funded organization which creates guidelines for being used in the healthcare system. In Canada, it's completely different, and we have federal and provincial levels, and there are different uh, developers, and there is not a specific just one single organization developing guidelines, as happened with NICE in the UK. So the, the focus will be different. However, one of the major things that I found in the literature review is that this focus on research prioritization could be, um, could be something that required further research and hasn't been appropriated used. So I think that this has been underestimated and there is a lot of information there in the development. So I would think that for Canada, one recommendation could be to uh, check um, closely uh, review clinical practice guidelines to find what are the gaps in the guidelines that are available to identify what are the gaps that have been found in the literature by the development by the development group and to focus the research funding, let's say for instance CIHR, to focus the research funding in those gaps that are identified or highlighted in the clinical practice guideline. That is a huge field of research that I would think would be a good focus for Canada. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I don't see any additional questions at the moment. Um, we'll just give it maybe one more minute to see if anyone has anything else they want to ask.
Um, while we're waiting, I will just go over a couple of things. So thank you everyone um, for joining us. And I apologize, my computer seems to be a little bit uh, wonky today. I don't know if it was WebEx or my computer, but it seemed to be, um, the phone line seemed to be working. So that's uh, that's a good thing. Um, okay, and I will interrupt myself now uh, for another question. So they ask, were any clinical practice guidelines found that you consider an ideal model of all of the factors you identified? Sorry. Um, I, we didn't search a specific clinical practice guideline. We only search and review literature from editorials, narrative review, discussion points, and research focused on what should be the role of clinical practice guideline. And we extracted from there what were the roles outside of the clinical encounter. So it was a comprehensive review, but focused on literature about guidelines. We didn't review clinical practice guidelines, but I could say from my experience, working of guidelines for more than 10 years, I would say that there is no perfect guideline for sure, not even from the methodological point of view and also neither for these roles. I don't know if guidelines should have a specific uh, uh, detail on these roles. At least they should say who should use and who shouldn't use the, the guideline. They should be very clear. And, and as, I t as I told you, it depends on the funder. But I could say that the guideline that kind of um, consider or uh, um, uh, most commonly consider or use it or describe a little bit of these roles in the process were the NICE guidelines, the guideline from the NICE in the UK. Uh, for instance, uh, 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 not only because the implementation section and implementation chapters of the guidelines are very strong and provides a lot of information of how to implement the guideline in the in the NHS in the UK, and they consider all these other roles, also because they are also providing research priority uh, 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 gaps, uh, sorry, research, research priority or research recommendations, which is also good to have a guideline that also not only give recommendation, but also provides a recommendation for further research. And this work that has been occurring in the UK in the last five years, trying to align guidelines with research funding agencies, that is very, very important and that will be very helpful for not only for improving health, health, uh, the quality of healthcare, which is the final aim of guidelines, but also to use guidelines to, to, to reduce research waste that is happening in, 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 in research in healthcare. So when they are recommending to focus on this, we should, uh, the research agency should focus on that. So NICE guidelines are also doing a good work in integrating or in linking the, the guidelines with the research funding. I don't think that they should go beyond that. It's, part or is the is the aim of the research funding funding to use the guideline however they think it, they should and it is not part of the guideline development group to to say how to spend the money but they should at least highlight so nice guidelines are a good example of considering at least some of these roles okay thank you um, and we had a comment come in from Jamie. He, t he uh, chatted this to everyone, so everyone should be able to see it. And he said, um, from an epi lens, not really a question, but more of a comment. Clinical practice guidelines are useful for surveillance, but heavily influence the collection and quality of data. As mentioned, there are guidelines and more training is needed for clinicians around precision medicine and precision public health. I'm not sure if you have a comment to add to that. Uh, that is very, very useful uh, from Jamie because uh, that is from the EpiLens. And um, uh, we didn't find specific uh, literature about the use on surveillance. I suppose that is going to be useful for sure. I, I would be very happy if, he, if Jamie could share with me if he has some literature that could, we could use because we know that there are other roles, but there is not too much literature on those roles, and those kind of minor roles that occur every day, and we did, 
didn't find literature to support them uh, in the in the journal publication. So more than happy to 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 hear from Jamie if he has some literature about that. Um, there is more tra training needed for clinicians around precision medicine, precision polyhealth. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you about that. Thank you.